Well, first of all, let me say uh, what I've never said in this sanctuary before. Uh, welcome to Socrates in the city. You can applaud now. That's traditionally, traditionally, uh, that's when people applaud. Um, I am so thrilled uh, to be here. Dallas is uh, one of my absolute favorite places uh, in the world. If people want to know where I am when I'm not home, probably it's Dallas. I get here uh, a, a fair amount. Uh, I've already recognized a bunch of you um, from other events. It is a joy to be here, and it's a joy to do Socrates in the city in Dallas. I think it's important for us to talk about what we call life, God, and other small topics in a fun way. I've always said, and I even said uh, earlier at a dinner we had, that if you know uh, that, you know, there is a God and that he's a God that is for us and not against us uh, and that he is the author of reality and all that kind of stuff, you really aren't afraid of anything. You're not afraid of exploring the truth. You're not afraid of where the facts might take you. You're not afraid of where the evidence might take you, uh, which is why it's my thesis that uh, science and real faith are friends, not enemies. They ought to be. Um, so I love to talk uh, to scientists. I have interviewed now Stephen Meyer, with whom uh, I'll be speaking in a minute. I've, I've interviewed him uh, a number of times before uh, at Socrates and City events, and every single time we've done it, I say, never again. Uh, and then something happens, I forget uh, what happened, and then somehow we end up doing it again. Uh, every single time I say, I'm not, not going to do it again, and here, here we are. Um, so we're going to get through this together. I don't want to be here any more than you do, trust me, okay? We're, gonna, we're just going to do our best to get through this. Um, Stephen Meyer has a few credentials I'd like to share with you. Um, he has a PhD in the history and philosophy of science from Cambridge. Who doesn't? Uh, he, as you heard, he's the director uh, of the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute uh, in Seattle. Uh, that's, that's actually slightly rarer. There are very few people who are the directors of the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute in Seattle. Uh, that's a smaller group of us, isn't it? Um, he, now this is a kind of a big one. He is one of the pioneers in articulating the theory of intelligent design in science. If that doesn't impress you, you're clearly not listening or you don't speak English. That is a big deal. I hate to embarrass people when they're in the room. Actually, that's not true. I love to embarrass people when they're in the room. But uh, that's a very big deal. I am thrilled uh, to think that tonight I get to speak to my friend, uh, Stephen Meyer, if in fact he's still my friend. I'm not going to look him in the eye. Um, he has written many books, uh, all of which I, I really must recommend. Uh, Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design, uh, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. Um, what is very rare about Stephen Meyer is that he is a real scientist who's operating at the top scientific level, uh, who's also able to communicate those ideas to those of us who are not operating at the top scientific level, which is a, a lot of us in the room. Yeah, um, I, I think it's really important that we have public conversations on the issues of science and faith and all those big things. It's why I've been doing Socrates in the City uh, all these years. And I have to say, uh, I really never have more fun uh, than when I get to talk to a brilliant scientist like Stephen Meyer, except when I'm actually talking to Stephen Meyer, who's here tonight. Stephen Meyer, welcome to Socrates in the City. Come on up. <laughs> I'm going to go. <laughs> After this, no never more. Again. Okay, this okay. is it. Yeah. This is the last one. Um, the the I, problem I have with these events is that I so enjoy your humorous introductions, I forget I have to come up and say something. Yeah, so, no, yeah. You, 
you, you didn't have to. I could just go on and on and on, but I think some of these people would leave quickly. Uh, <laughs> you, um, I, I've talked to you before, but a lot of the folks here uh, and who are watching uh, this uh, on YouTube or on their phones or wherever they are on the subway uh, because we're videotaping this, they don't know your story. So I want to talk about your new book, um, which excites me like crazy, I have to say. I didn't think you could write another book that... Uh, I would be really, really excited about it, but you've done it, uh, and the title of that book... Now, you, you, you have a title for the new book. Yes. Okay, what is the title for the new book? The Return of the God Hypothesis. The Return of the God Hypothesis. Right. So my first question, not yet, but when we get to that book will be, what do you mean the return of the God Hypothesis? Yeah, um, but I, I want to talk to you about your career a little bit and how you got to be who you are. I said you're a scientist. Uh, you're also a philosopher. Right. Okay, so how did you get to be who you are today? What was the path when you were, where did you grow up? I grew up in the Northwest, uh, Seattle area. I went to university in uh, Washington State, at Whitworth College, now university. Um, I majored in physics and geology, and I took a lot of philosophy classes along the way. And uh, I came to Dallas Is after that, I graduated. Did, now, you... Say it again, you majored in... Physics. Physics. Yeah. And you took a lot of philosophy classes along the way. Now, is that just to make other people feel stupid? What did you... Why do you... <laughs> like, what is the reason for that? Is there an actual reason, or are you just trying to make us feel bad? What well, is the... I was always interested in, in the, you know, the question my mom, at age 12, told me on the way home from church one day, you're going to be a philosopher, she said. Some of the questions that really? I was asking... But um, I was always interested in the questions that were at the intersection between science and philosophy. You know, so I'm taking physics classes. I was yeah. one of those annoying students that kept asking the professor, but, but why? But why that? But right. why that? And, um, for example, I was talking to kids today at uh, the Covenant School here in Dallas. And we, started, we had a little conversation about uh, Newton and his theory of universal gravity. Something we all learn about in physics class, you drop a ball, it falls. Why does it fall? It falls because of gravity. Then you ask the question, what is gravity? Gravity turns out to be nothing more than the tendency for unsupported bodies to fall. And it's all kind of circular. And there's something really mysterious about something that we scientists think is sort of ordinary. We have equations, we have laws. But you think about the moon up there in the sky. It's influencing, it's causing tidal action on the Earth Get We're out of here. A long way away, but there's no, no touching. No touching. There's no touching. No pushing and pulling. Newton was mystified by this himself. He called it action at a distance. How does the moon, separated by empty space, cause action on the earth? You're, you're asking me? Well, it's a question. It's a question. I would say uh, gravity. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Um, it's just a thing that mass has. It's a property. It's a property, uh, yeah. That's as far as I'm willing to take it. Yeah, it's a, this, was the, see, this was the thing they were trying to get away from in the early part of the scientific revolution. What the medievals used to do is they would name, uh, 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 they would give to an effect a name which was just renaming the right. effect its own cause. That's so like if, chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, right right, right, right. I'm fatigued all the time, I would say chronically, yes. and they would say it sounds like a syndrome, syndrome. let's call it chronic exactly, fatigue syndrome. Exactly. And you say, what is it? And they say it's uh, yeah. chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, or, or uh, opium puts you to sleep because it has a dormitive virtue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then the problem was Newton comes along, he writes this beautiful mathematical equation describing, math, describing the movement of the planets yeah. and the, the, the force of gravity but what gravity is, what's actually causing it, he's, in the Latin he says, hypothesis non fingo, which means I don't feign to know the cause. Non fingo? Non fingo, he doesn't know. And so, so you, you, there's stuff in science that scientists get real used to manipulating and describing, but there's deep mysteries underlying it that we hardly ever think about, but Newton did, and that's what fascinated me in, gra in well, grad school. I think th that's one of the reasons I love talking to you, because there are a lot of uh, really brainy scientists but they might not be thinking about why. Right. To think about why, to ask those questions, I think those of us who are not scientists uh, have those why questions, and we always want to ask a scientist. Um, and uh, sometimes asking a scientist is like asking, you know, a bad priest who says, shut up, we don't ask questions here. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, because questions are challenging, as you said. 
So, all right. I, so I had, had a terrific physics professor in college who finally caught on to what was bu bugging me. And he'd say, okay, listen, you, when, when you ask why, and then I give you an answer, and then you ask why again, and I give you an answer, and when I give you the answer, it's just the phenomenon. It's what nature does. We know not why. Then it's okay, and you can stop asking questions. And that's when I finally realized, oh, I do understand physics. I, I understand it in the same way that everyone else understands it. We really right. don't in know words, why. In other words, we don't understand yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, and even the great Isaac Newton had to, you know, put some English on the ball by using the Latin term non fingo. Yeah. Right? It kind of sounds, you know, very erudite. And it means, I don't know. Well, um, his, his, his ultimate <laughs> answer to that question, interestingly, since we're talking about science and faith, was uh, the, what, what had to do with uh, what he, the way God orders the, the universe. Right. He wrote a letter to a bishop named Bishop Bentley. He was being pressed by other scientists who realized that his equations didn't answer the cause question. What causes gravity? Right. He says, I don't know. They, says, well, the, they said, well, then you're not really being a proper what, uh, scientist. In those days, they called them mechanical philosophers. Right. But he admitted privately to uh, a bishop that uh, he believed that the real cause of gravity was constant spirit action. It was God's way of ordering the universe. And he quoted a... Uh, or paraphrased a, uh, a passage of the Bible that talked about in Christ all things are held together, the Colossians passage. So he was a deeply religious guy who realized that some of these deep mysteries were not answered by materialistic cause and effect, right. that there must be something that was beyond that, that right. was in fact spiritual. Yeah, that sounds like a theological way of saying, I don't know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, wow. Now, this is a funny Anyway, question. that's the I, sort of stuff that interested I, me, I, that I, I intersection. Was, I was going to yeah. say, I don't want to get stuck on this, yeah. but I have to ask you. Yeah. Uh, Newton uh, lived, you know, 300 plus years ago. In the 300 years since Newton, have we figured out what gravity is? Uh, my, one of my grad school supervisors in Cambridge made this point to me. He said, in 300 years, we've, we still really don't know why. No. We have new theories. Einstein said that gravity was caused by massive bodies curving space. And then that affected the trajectory of other bodies passing through that curved space. But curved space is still like, well, it's not a thing doing any pushing and pulling. It's kind of hard to understand. And then people have come up with the idea of gravitons, but those are massless particles causing gravity. So it, of course they are. You know, it, 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 it doesn't get any better. Let's just um, say that, yeah. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm trying to understand what you're saying because I'm going to give a talk here tomorrow at 9 a.m. and I, I want to repeat a lot of this stuff. Um, you, um, okay, so you had an affinity to ask the big questions. You obviously had an affinity for, for science. Uh, as an undergraduate, um, what did you think you wanted to do and at what point did you decide to go in the direction that you've gone in? Well, I, uh, after I graduated, I came to Dallas. I got a job in the 80s when the oil market was up and I worked for a, as a, a geophysicist for a, a Atlantic Richfield company, a big major oil company back in the 80s. Um, and then in the mid 80s, oil market was down. I had applied for a rotary scholarship and I didn't get it the first time, but I got it the second time and was able to go to Britain. And what was the, the big event that, that occurred for me here was uh, an extraordinary conference, maybe somewhat like this one, but it was uh, about the issue of um, uh, how science and faith go together. And the conference was at the Dallas Hilton, and there were, there were, there were representatives of what was called scientific materialism, or what we'd call the, you know, like the new atheists, the scientific atheists, and uh, scientists who were theists. And they were discussing the big questions, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, and the origin and nature of human consciousness. And I heard about it the night before and attended just as a walk-up. And I was just blown away by what I heard. In this uh, for very first session, one of the most famous uh, astrophysicists um, in the history of, of astronomy, astrophysics, was there. His name is Alan Sand it was there, Alan Sandage. Sandage was a, an agnostic uh, Jew, well-known for that point of view for most of his career. He'd worked with Edwin Hubble, the great astronomer who had verified that the universe was expanding, and had, which was crucial to establishing that the universe had a beginning. And Sandage shocked everybody by uh, sitting with the other theists, though he was thought to be one of the materialists, and in his talk explained how the evidence for both the beginning of the universe and its exquisite fine-tuning 
had convinced him that there must be something more than a strictly materialistic account of the universe. And then he re proceeded to reveal how um, he, he realized that the evidence was pointing in a frankly theistic direction, and he didn't like it. And he was trying to suppress it, and finally he confronted himself and said, wait a minute, I've prided myself my whole life on my scientific objectivity. Now the evidence is pointing me towards the God hypothesis. What is it in me that doesn't want that to be true? And I was incredibly taken well, with this Well, I was going to say, that yeah. is one honest man. And that's rare, right? Because we always, I think, uh, the question we don't want to ask ourselves is, why am I biased? Because we just don't want to think that we are biased. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's an extraordinary thing. So y you were quite a young man at that time. I was 26, time. walked in off the street to hear this, and early in my career as a scientist here working in you industry. You just walked in off the street? Yeah, they let were me you, sign up. Were yeah. you sober at this time? <laughs> I just want to make sure. I was a little delirious leaving because in addition to Sandage, they had this amazing session on the origin of life. And the, you know my book about the sig signature in the cell was really a culmination of what I first learned that in that uh, So this was conference. a life-changing... It was absolutely. It was, you know, I'm going this direction, and I meet all these interesting guys and uh, scientists, and I begin to think about these big questions in a new way. The session on the origin of life, and we'll have Jim Tour here tomorrow. He's, he's sitting in the front row, phenomenal scientist from Rice, talking about it. The origin of life discipline by the middle of the 80s had reached an impasse. It's, gotten, it's made no progress since. The big problem is trying now, to get... Now, hang on. When you say the origin of life... Uh, you're talking about the primordial soup. Exactly. Okay, so how do, just how do you get I want to the... translate for those of us who are not at the top scientific level. There's a lot of us here, right? Uh, okay, so you're saying that in the mid-80s, um, there was, how do we put this? They got to the point where people were, scientists were understanding that even though they had been saying since the Miller experiment right. decades right. earlier, they'd been saying that there was this primordial soup and lightning struck and the next thing you know, we chemicals have arranged chemicals themselves and, they and became cells a cell. and whatever. Yeah. But you're saying yeah. that in the, in the mid-80s, suddenly they had gotten to the point of wondering why they didn't have evidence for this hypothesis. Yeah, like in Apollo 11, Houston, we have a problem. And the problem was... There are many problems, but the most fundamental problem was the discovery of the information-bearing properties of DNA and the other large, what are called biomacromolecules right. in the cell. Uh, Watson and Crick, 1953, they elucidate the structure of DNA. 1957, Crick realizes that the su chemical subunits along the interior of that double helix are functioning just like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters like the zeros and ones in a machine code and that they are directing the construction of the proteins and protein machines that all cells need to stay alive. So you've got digital information directing the construction of the crucial components of living cells, and people begin to, they, this gets all elucidated in the, in the 60s, and we, people begin to reflect on this, and the Origin of Life guys say, well, to explain the Origin of Life, that now means we have to explain this complicated information processing system. And that's where it got really sticky. And because nope, getting, nobody wants to work that hard. No, no. I mean, how do you get chemistry to produce code? It turned out to be a really difficult problem. And yeah. I, was, I first learned about this at this same conference. There was a leading origin of life researcher named Dean Kenyon, Stanford PhD, professor out in California. He'd worked at NASA. He had a best-selling uh, graduate-level book on this called Biochemical Predestination. And at this conference, he disclaims his own book and explains that he has now become persuaded that there must be some kind of guiding intelligence responsible for the origin of life. He called it an intelligent cause. And there were three other professors on this panel who had just written a book called The Mystery of Life's Origin who were arguing the same thing. And I was working in industry, in geophysics, doing uh, digital signal processing, which was an early form of information technology. And I got absolutely fascinated with the idea that the, that the, the key to the mystery of the origin of life was actually information, it was code. And obviously that, uh, that follows you through, through your career and we'll talk about that a little bit, but I, I um, so but just to go back, so, so everything changes for you, so what, what do you do at this point? You decide I wanna get a PhD in what? Well, I was thinking of something at the intersection of science and, and, and philosophy. There's a field called the philosophy of science. Uh, Oxford and Cambridge have great programs in that area. I applied for a Rotary Scholarship here in Dallas and I, 
uh, was a runner-up the first year, um, and uh, actually to a, a great candidate who was also a former Miss Texas. And uh, when I was feeling kind of down in the dumps about it, one of the rotary uh, adjudicators said, well, don't feel too bad. She, she was a great candidate academically, but she had some attributes that you did not have, my young. <laughs> so, uh, other than strictly academic, he said, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. He was referring to the baton uh, twirling yeah, yeah, competition. Yes, yeah. It's extraordinary, because I know you're not good at that. Yes. Okay, so... <laughs> Second year I got the scholarship, you get the got scholarship, to go to Britain. You yeah. go to Cambridge, and, and what are you thinking? I mean, you're getting a PhD, but where, where do you, what, what do you want to do with that? Well, I had been... T one of the guys that was at this conference uh, was Charles Thaxton, and he was working at a small think tank here in Dallas, um, which is, uh, was directed by John Buell, who is here in the audience tonight, who in some ways was you know, ground zero for this whole concept of intelligent design. Charles was the lead author on this book, The Mystery of Life's Origin. And I was introduced to him uh, in the aftermath of the conference, started meeting him in his office and talking about these issues. So by the time I got, actually got to England, I knew what I wanted to work on. I wanted to work on this origin of life question. Thaxton had the idea that, that it might be possible to make a scientific argument or a scientific case for the theory of intelligent design. And I got think, I wondered, was that possible? And to, to answer that question, I really needed to study the scientific methods that people like Darwin used to reconstruct events in the distant past. Because this isn't the same kind of science. It's not like going into the laboratory and, and uh, getting something to replicate itself under controlled conditions. You had to reconstruct what might have happened. And so I began to study Darwin's method of scientific reasoning and became convinced that that could be applied to the origin of life problem in a way that would, would support a design hypothesis. And at what point did you think, I've got something here? Well, I, the first couple years after grad school, I, 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 w I was convinced that there was a method by which you could make this case. But there were a lot of other questions that had to be answered. For example, what do we mean by information? It has multiple definitions. And there's a mathematical definition that just mean, is a measure of the improbability of a, of a sequence of, of symbols. But that mathematical definition called Shannon information, named for a pioneering uh, scientist named Claude Shannon who developed information theory as a, a subject, didn't capture the notion of meaning or function. And so we were groping for, and so just an improbable sequence might be the result of random processes. And so it might, the imp, random processes might produce Shannon information. But DNA had more, it had something beyond just an improbable array. It was, it had specificity of arrangement in order to produce a function, like the kind of information we use in computer code or the kind of information that, you know, we, we, in, in a book. Or, and so it was meeting a, another younger guy at the time, uh, Bill Dembski, William Dembski, and we began to talk about the, these issues of what, what type of information, what's the analytical tool we can develop to capture the thing that indicates intelligent design? What, what, what is it that intelligent agents produce that undirected natural processes don't produce? Okay. And it wasn't Shannon information, it was functional information or specified information. Um, I, I wanna, just because yeah. uh, you, you've said that now, I wanna go broad for a second and, and talk about the concept of intelligent design. For those who really aren't f familiar with it, um, I guess uh, the, when you talk about material, uh, the, the materialist hypothesis that there is nothing in the universe except material, right? And, and people say unless you can uh, touch it or smell it or whatever, in other words, un unless science can put in a test tube and it, it doesn't exist, right? Right. And it's always struck me that most people don't operate with that hypothesis. Most people know there's something else, even if you don't know what the something else is, right? Even just the mystery of gravity would lead you to think, as it did Newton, there's something else, something we haven't discovered yet. But then the big question is, is there something else beyond the known universe? And we don't just mean at the end of the universe is there something beyond it, but is there something beyond the material. Well, before we even get to that big question of beyond the universe, I think it's, it's perfectly appropriate to think of what, it, what there is beyond just the matter and energy around us. And right. there's, another, there's another fundamental entity that we're all aware of, and that's mind, because we have them. We are self-consciously aware. Speak for yourself, Stephen Meyer. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> what, now, when you say we all have minds, right, 
we know that a materialist would say, no, 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 no. We have brains, and a brain is like a computer. You're talking about some spiritual thing called mind. I don't believe in that, and I believe you're confusing mind with brain, and you're somehow spiritualizing it. So isn't it true that a materialist, a scientistic thinker, I don't mean scientific, but scientistic, somebody who says there's nothing outside the realm of science, that's it, would argue there is no mind, even though most people kind of feel that there is. He well, would, you have a, a, a lovely, vividly blue tie on right now. And I have a... Do I? I'm complimenting your tie, but I'm also perceiving it, right? Yeah. So I have a, I have a self-conscious awareness of that bright blue color, and there's nothing that corresponds to the electrochemistry in my brain. Uh, the electrochemistry in my brain, we think, helps... Uh, generate that image, but I have a, a first-person self-conscious awareness of that blue that is, that is separate from what my brain cells are doing. And most of us have an awareness of our, of our own consciousness and our own, um, our own rational um, abilities as conscious minds. So we have a, a first-person direct introspective awareness of the reality of a mind. And, and now, so, now say the same thing in English. I, I just mean... No, I know. Yeah, yeah. Actually, let me say what you just said. <laughs> yeah. I, most of these people know what you just said. But just to be clear, because this is such an important point, and, and I want to kind of pivot on this point. What you're saying is that a computer or a brain uh, by itself is not conscious. Consciousness, your ability to perceive yourself and to perceive other people, whatever that mystery is... To think, to deliberate, to hope, to fear, to all those things, yes cannot be accounted for through circuits or just a brain or whatever. You're saying there's this other thing. And I think most people would, would agree with you that there's this thing, whether it's consciousness or mind, there's something beyond just uh, some pink tissue in our skulls. And so then my question is, why do people uh, in, in the scientific world today have this hard line. In other words, why do they get upset at the implication that there's something beyond what science can tell us? Why is there this, even the idea that there's some kind of a problem between faith and science? Where do we, where do we think that came from? Because that's, that's the question that we're really talking yeah, about. Yeah, there's a, a couple of ways to answer that. One is historically to look back in the late 19th century. There's a whole series of, of theories about origins that uh, suggests that undirected natural processes could account for anything, including, for example, the origin of life and the origin of new forms of life. Okay, Darwin. so the first issue here is Dar Darwin. You, you get a, a, a scientific materialist synthesis at the end of the 19th century, and then they codify the idea that if you're going to be a scientist, you must explain things in terms of undirected material processes. That's one way of answering your question. It just sort of, I mean, what you're saying is it just sort of happened. Well, there's an historical shift in thinking in the period of of Newton and Kepler and Boyle, right. they were all, they, they made design arguments in their scientific work. This was part of I mean, many of, of them obviously were devout Christians. They were, but they also thought they were seeing evidence of design in their scientific studies. Okay, so, they, so, yeah. so historically, there was not a problem or a perceived problem between so-called faith or Christian faith and so-called science. But something the happened. one supported the other, and there was a kind of close connection between okay. the two. Where, so on the contrary, yeah, yeah. They, they supported each so other. So this was a shift in the late 19th century. A, a, a canon of method was established or, or promulgated by you know, Darwin and others. It said, if you're going to be a scientist, you must limit yourself to explain things by reference to material processes only. But there are so many things that we just look around us, we think of the information on a road sign or the computer code or many, many things around us we know are the product of, of intelligence, of mind. Right. And this is the, the other way of answering your question. What happened? Why do people object? Many scientists working at the bench, become, they forget about the role their own mind is playing in the experiments that they're, that, that they're uh, uh, executing. Yeah. So uh, Professor Tour, for example, has has shown that many of these guys doing these what are called prebiotic simulation experiments 
are actively involved in choosing purified chemicals. They have a chemical recipe that they use to get the, the molecules to, to uh, combine and recombine in different ways so that the molecules are more life relevant. But at every step of the way, this process is guided by their own scientific intelligence, and they just kind of forget that the mind is playing a crucial right. role. In other words, know. they're cheating. Well, it is a cheat if you uh, want to that, turn around. No, but I mean, of course, yeah, that's yeah. of course what it is. Now, James Tour is, is right here. Is he misrepresenting you, or are we okay? He's okay? All right. If, he's, if he misrepresents you... He's much better you, on this, and you'll hear him up. tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Is Marshall McLuhan in the audience? Uh, I guess um, everybody who cares about life, the meaning of life, we, th we think about these things, and we think about how do we know what we know, and so on and so forth. So what you've just said, um, you know, most of us here grew up in a world where uh, the Miller experiment that said that life... Uh, was created out of the primordial soup with no uh, touch from God or anything like that. We all were taught this in schools, and it was accepted. And when in the 1980s there were questions about this, nobody contacted us by mail or phone and said, by the way, you know that <laughs> thing that was on the test? Uh, we no longer really uh, know if that's true. We just wanted you to be clear on that. It's like a like product, you know, a recall on, on, a, on a car. <laughs> they would have to legally contact you and say, by the way, you know, we told you it was the greatest car in the world. It could kill you. So uh, that never happened. And that to me is interesting because that's how as a culture we process stuff, right? right? Like right. stuff gets out there. I was always taught that Darwin, um, you know, Darwin was right and the idea of natural selection and we did, this is how it all happened. No one ever contacted me to say, by the way, there are a lot of big questions that have come up. And even evolutionists like Stephen uh, Jay Gould at Harvard is asking questions. But that information never gets out. It, it, there's been no recall on those bad textbooks. That's so, absolutely true. So but nobody in, or, in Origin of Life research today thinks that the Miller-Urey experiment solves the problem. At best, it would give you amino acids, which are a building block for proteins. But to get an actual protein that folds up and does an actual job, you've got to sequence those amino acids properly. That requires a big information input. And that's the unanswered question. Where does that information come right. from? And, and, and they don't know. And uh, I remember reading an article in the Atlantic Monthly in the 80s on this question of the origin of life. And I don't know, uh, but I remember reading it, and it was a long article, but what it said at the end effectively was, we thought we knew how life evolved, but the more we know, the more we discover that in fact, we have no idea, right? right. And, and it feels like that's what you're talking about with the return of the God hypothesis. In other words, that the more we know scientifically, the more we realize that the concept of a creator, of a mind, it's, it's more and more plausible the more science progresses, right. which is the opposite of the thesis that the more we know in science, the less there's a need for God. Yeah, this is the opposite of a God of the gaps argument. Right. In the case I made for intelligent design just in biology, right. I actually self-consciously applied the method of reasoning that I learned from Darwin. And he had this rule of reasoning, which was, um, if you want to explain an event in the remote past, you should look around and observe cause and effect processes and invoke a vera causa, a true cause, a cause which is known to produce the effect in question. And I got to thinking, well, what is the effect, what is the cause that we know produ that produces digital information? And we know of only one. It's a mind. It's a programmer. Bill Gates, our local hero in, in Seattle, says DNA is like... Uh, like a uh, DNA is like a, a computer program, only much more advanced than any we've ever devised. And, uh, and in fact, we know from our experience, our uniform and repeated experience, that whenever we see information and we trace it back to its source, whether it's in a hieroglyphic inscription, a paragraph in a book, right. information embedded in a radio signal, uh, or the, the information that's generated in uh, a prebiotic simulation experiment or a, a computer program that's supposedly simulating evolution, there's always an intelligent input that accounts for that information. So I said, maybe we should learn something from nature and, and apply that to the problem of the origin of information, which is at the foundation of life, and infer that there was a designing intelligence behind that information too. Okay, but the, the, the person disagreeing with you would say, um, given infinite time, anything can happen. In other words, if I flip a coin and it lands on its side, people go, ooh, 
But they know it can happen sometimes. It'll happen. If I flip a coin 10,000 times, uh, once or twice or whatever, that it'll happen. But if I flip it again and it lands on its side a second time, you'd be a little weirded out. What's the trick? If I did it a third time and I sat here for 20 minutes and every time I flipped a dime, it landed on its side, everyone would say, something's going on. This doesn't make sense. But somebody might say, look, mathematically, given an infinite number of time, it is possible that that would happen in infinity. So what really changed all of this, it seems to me, is the Big Bang Theory that said, we no longer have infinite time, we only have whatever it is, 12 or 15 billion years. So at what point did the Big Bang Theory grab a hold, uh, generally speaking, and began to freak out the scientists who'd pinned everything on infinite time? That's a, a great question. Quick little sidelight is that in a di th that's absolutely right. You know, you, there, that established what is called a limit on the probabilistic resources, the number of tries you would have right. to win the, win the biological cosmic lottery, if you will. Uh, there's another... Fa another um, aspect of that, and, and uh, Dr. Turer will probably talk about this tomorrow in his talk, and that is that chemically speaking, time is actually not your friend. That when, if you're lucky enough to get some molecules to arrange themselves into something that's right. moving in the right direction of life, all the other processes at work are going to swamp that and unwind that before you get any further. And he'll explain more about how the chemistry of that works, but, but the chance-based argument is, is suspect for two reasons. One, time isn't your friend. It works against the chemical synthesis of life, but also there's a limit to the amount of time, and that's absolutely right. In both of my books, I, lo I look carefully at the... At, at the mathematics of this. And I have a little, an illustration I like to use of a bike lock. You've got a four dial lock right. and you, and I ask, often ask the audience, well, uh, you know, if, you're, if you have a thief, is it more likely that he'll crack the code or not? And they'll say, oh, well, four dial lock, it's, more, it's unlikely. Well, unless the thief has enough time to sample more than half of the combinations. So you always have to assess how many, if you're assessing the plausibility of a random search for an informational sequence, right. you have to know how many opportunities you have right. versus the complexity of the sequence. It turns out when you do the math, both in the prebiotic case and in the biological case, that is, even assuming you've got life to start with and now the Darwinian mechanism of mutation and selection takes over, in both cases, you don't have the probabilistic resources necessary to build even standard length functional proteins. That there's so many possible combinations that have to be searched that there's not enough time in a, ran okay. a random so, search to succeed. So the larger idea, and I know some folks are, are, are tracking and maybe some aren't, but the idea is that w w many of us have heard this idea, I don't know who said it, uh, but uh, somebody once said that, you know, if you have, uh, you, you probably know it more exactly than I do, but, you know, monkeys typing on typewriters, right, randomly, hitting random stuff, eventually, given enough time, randomly, they would produce the works of William Shakespeare. Um, because it just has to happen randomly, right, you know, that if, if, if a monkey just goes like this, at some point, maybe it takes years, but words will randomly uh, come together. So what we're really dealing with here is the idea that you're saying, I, I, I make, want to make sure that I'm, I'm clear on this, that you're saying that what is in DNA is so complex, it's like a library of books. So it's not like a monkey that would just, you know, random, 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 and it's like, oh, he just typed the word the. Oh, he just typed the word cat. We're talking about 50 novels by Dickens and Tolstoy. We're talking about something so complex that you're saying that science now knows that there could never have been enough time. It's, it's, the calculations that I show show that it's more likely that a random search for a new gene sequence capable of building a new functional protein will, it's overwhelmingly more likely that such a search would fail than it would that it would succeed given all the possible opportunities there are for such a search to occur since the first life till now. So it's still 
you know, remember Jim Carrey in that film? You know, he asks the girl to go out, and, and he says, she says, he says, what are the chances that a girl like me and a guy like you could get together? And right, he messes right. his pickup line, and, uh, and she says, not good. And he says, what do you mean? You know, like one in a one in hundred? And she says, no, one in a million, buddy. And then he starts jumping up and down and says, oh, so there's a chance. There's right, a chance. Right. There's always a chance. Right. But the question is, is it more likely that a random search would succeed or fail? And we can show conclusively that it's more likely that it will fail. And therefore, the idea that natural selection plus random mutation is the means by which new information was generated is also more likely to be false than true. And in science, we prefer not to have more likely to be false right. hypotheses, and we prefer more likely to be true hypotheses. The, mo the most fascinating part of what you just said to me is that somebody could be as smart as you and still watch Jim Carrey movies. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that the big takeaway? That's the surprise. Um, it's incredible. Um, okay, so I have a question. Uh, your book is called The Return of the God right, Hypothesis. Right. Okay, so to frame this, you have been uh, uh, one of the creators and proponents of this thing called intelligent design, which says the universe looks designed. Science tells us that it looks designed from the more we know, the more it doesn't look like it just evolved randomly, right? But intelligent design never posits who the designer might be. And that's why you have felt comfortable and others, Behe and Demsky, saying that it's science. We're just telling you what science tells us, and science tells us it looks designed. We're not telling you who did the designing. That's not our business. We're scientists. Is that reasonably accurate? Roughly, roughly the case. The theory of intelligent design, brief, brief definition, is the idea that there are certain features of living systems in the universe that are best explained by a designing intelligence as opposed to a purely undirected material process. Okay. okay? Uh, in my writing about the d design that we see in life, I have to this point not tried to make a case for the identity of the designer because it is a, there are two possibilities if you're just talking about biology. Life arises well after time equals zero, after the beginning of the universe. So it's at least logically possible that there could be some imminent form of intelligence and an intelligence in the universe that might be responsible for the evidence of design that we see in cells and, and, and animals and so forth. And I've never heard that hypothesis. I'm not kidding. Well, you know who's That's... actually proposed it is no. Richard Dawkins has, has, has mentioned this. And so, so did, once did Francis Crick. Um, Dawkins did it maybe in an unguarded moment when he was being interviewed by Ben Stein in the film Expelled. Right. And he suggested maybe it was a space alien or some, some agent within the cosmos yeah. seeded life to planet Earth. Right. Crick actually wrote this up as a, as a semi-serious proposal in a book in 1980. He got so much pushback, he said, I'm never going to talk about the origin of life again. Right. It's just too hard a problem. But um, it's, I, I've never been persuaded by that idea because even if you posit a prior intelligence in the cosmos, then you still have the information problem all over again. Where'd you get the information to build that? Who made okay. the alien? Who, who made the alien? Right. But it's, it's out there. I've always, I've always said that the theory of intelligent design is based on scientific evidence, but it has theistic implications. It seems it, it fits better in a theistic worldview. But I've also long, since that conference in 1985, been interested in the cosmology and the physics. And I've done a deep dive on the biology for the last you know, 10 or 15 years. And I wanted to get back to this, you know, that initial presentation I heard from Alan Sandage and some of those, those scientists and explore what the physics and the cosmology can tell us about the identity of the designer. Because if you just think about another evidence of design, and you've written about this, you had that wonderful piece in the Wall Street Journal around Christmas time in 2014 about all the fine tuning of the universe. The laws in, of physics are finely tuned to allow for the possibility of life. The right. initial conditions of the universe are finely tuned. The expansion rate of the universe. We have this kind of Goldilocks universe where everything is just right to right. allow for the possibility of life. But that's built into the cosmos from the very beginning. It's built into the fabric of the laws of nature. No alien uh, being or no imminent being within the cosmos can be responsible for the laws of physics that make its very existence possible and which preceded its origin back to the, back to the very Big Bang. Okay, so again, uh, just so we're tracking, you were, uh, first, when we're talking about the origin of life, uh, theoretically, uh, we're talking about something that happened less than four billion years ago because that's our, our, our sense, unless we're, we're young uh, 
Earth creationists, our but sense would be either, that the either Earth way, is, long after the beginning of the universe. Okay, right. But, but right. But so now, what you're talking about when you say cosmology, you're talking about that moment, uh, many, many more billions of years before, whatever. What, what, what's the guess these days? Thirteen point eight. Thirteen point eight. Yeah. Billion. Yeah. I knew that. Uh, and um, so you're saying that in that moment, okay, this is many, many billions of years before the Earth existed in any form, uh, when the universe expanded out of nothing, which is what scientists say, in that moment, it appears to have been pre-designed... It was a setup job. ...to do, yeah. to become what it is well and to, so this is this is part of why you're you're saying that it become e even if you look at that it becomes more or i should say when you look at that in addition to the difficulty of the origin of life being explained the difficulty of everything existing right being explained so one, one of our other colleagues will be speaking tomorrow is jay richards and he's uh, written a lot on the fine tuning there's one particular um uh, clip of his in a, in, a, in, a, in a science documentary where he explains this beautifully. You have, there's, there are two types of fine tuning. One has to do with the strength of the physical laws and the, the, these uh, numbers that physicists represent, they, they're called the universal constant. So if gravity were a little stronger, a little weaker, if electromagnetism were a little stronger, a little weaker, if the ratio between these forces were a little off, life would be impossible. And they're exquisitely finely tuned. You know, one in 10 to the 40th power or more, you know, with these, so. It's actually loony. It's like loony it's, crazy. It's, it's, it's yeah. loony. And Engineers here would be familiar with the concept of tolerances. These are incredibly tiny tolerances. But then there's another type of fine tuning which has to do with the, the arrangement of matter and energy at the beginning of the universe. And um, it, it, to get these stable, orderly things we call galaxies that can host planetary systems, the, uh, the Oxford physicist, uh, um, uh, sorry, has uh, um, Fred Roger, no, Roger Penrose has Penrose. calculated that the fine tuning of the, of the original configuration of matter would have had to be exquisitely finely tuned. The number he came up with in his calculations was one in one part to the 10 to the 10 to the 123. You, you can fill a universe with the zeros after that number. What? It's a, what they call a hyper-exponential fine-tuning. So, pe okay. And, that, and that's, that's, that's like getting all the matter and energy in just the right place so it will unfold to make stable galaxies. Okay. So this is completely separate from the four constants. Right, being, that's a different issue, but okay. those are also fine-tuned. Right, well, I'll say. Uh, the, so, so, so the question becomes, Stephen, what does the scientific establishment do? In other words, I, I made the case, and I'll talk about it tomorrow morning, that the more science knows, the more painful it is to put forward the hypothesis that it just happened randomly. In other words, it becomes less and less and less and less and less and less possible to believe that it happened randomly. Now, that's the science. So why doesn't the scientific establishment own up to that? Or what do they do with that? In other words, what you're saying, that they wouldn't necessarily argue with it. It's the conclusion that they right. don't like. S some of the physicists have definitely seen the design implications right from the beginning. One of the first physicists to discover a crucial fine-tuning parameter was uh, Fred Hoyle, the famous astrophysicist, who was himself at the time a really, a really uh, committed atheist. And he discovered... The, all the fine-tuning parameters that were necessary to make it possible to build carbon in the universe, which turns out to be necessary to make, make long chain-like molecules which are necessary to make life. And he was so blown away with the, the, the precision of these fine-tuning parameters that he said a common-sense interpretation of the data suggests that a super-intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology to make life possible. Uh, and many this other... Is, this is... Oh. The atheist admitted this. Right, and he, he in, near the end of his career, he's very much, I, I met him when I was in grad school, and he was actually very, very sympathetic to the intelligent design idea in biology by that time as well. Now, I, he's, by the way, the man who gave us the term the Big Bang. Well, as a, it was as a pejorative term. He was trying to ridicule it because he didn't want the Big Bang to be true because, as you said, it implied that there was a beginning to the universe and a creation wow, of it. I didn't know that. So he was really all in the tank for scientific materialism. Right. But the fine-tuning evidence just completely turned him around. 
There, and there are other, many other great physicists who have seen uh, the, the fine-tuning evidence, the most commonsensical way to interpret it, the most natural way to interpret it, is that fine-tuning requires a fine-tuner. Right. But other, other physicists really dedicated to this scientific materialist worldview right. have posited alternative explanations, the most popular of which today is that the idea that there's a gabillion other universes out there, sometimes called the multiverse, so many in fact that it was, would be necessary at some point for some universe to get exactly the right combination of factors to make life possible. It's winning the cosmic right. lottery idea. And even I know that that's incredibly dumb. <laughs> that, that is, um, well, it's funny because sometimes, um, you know, uh, angry atheists, whatever, have used this term, the flying spaghetti monster, to talk about God and stuff. And I thought to myself, to believe that there is an infinite number of universes or, or some outrageous number of universes in order to explain why this one just happened to be perfect, right? It's, it's kind of like saying, like, if I have a, a, a lock with, with four... Uh, what do you call it on them, you know, for... Clicks, yeah. For clicks or whatever it is. Yeah. I've, got, I've got a lock like that, and somebody just walks into a room and just gets it just like that. And you say, well, there were 10,000 of those locks, and they were all random, and one of them just, you know, it just so happens that it happened to be the right one. I used to do this as a gag in my, in my classes. I'd pass around a, a lock to illustrate why, why does fine-tuning trigger the design inference? And I'd pass a lock around to the students and, and tell them that what I was trying to demonstrate was that chance, that chance would be an implausible way of explaining the fine-tuning. Because one way to represent the fine-tuning is with a, set, a series of dials that are all set just right. right. So I'd pass the lock around to student one, two, three, four, five. I'd get to student six or seven, and the student would pop the lock open. And then, and then students would then start with cat calls and sort of hooting like, aha, we showed you up, prof, see, see uh, chance can do it. But then invariably, someone in the class would say, wait a minute, was he for real? Was that a plant? Was that a setup job? And, it, and then they'd start to accuse me. And then I'd go, moi? Why would I do something like that? And then, Who, moi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they knew I had a reputation for gags in class. And, <laughs> um, and, pre and they would make a design inference because they realized right. that... Not only was the event improbable, but it was functionally specified to do something. Well, and the also law. the idea that we have an innate sense when something doesn't make sense, right? right? right. And, and what we're talking about now, a lock with, with, with four of these dials, the universe, it's like a lock with... Big exponentially with billions numbers and of dials. Billions, yeah. billions and billions and billions and billions of dials. Right. So you're telling us that the most... Um, uh, plausible, com the, the most plausible explanation that scientists are making is that, oh yeah, um, there are an infinite number of universes. The reason I find that hilarious is that there is literally no evidence for that. There can't be. There are, right. are other universes beyond our own. Right. And yet, scientists who believe it must be evidence that leads us to our conclusions, only evidence, are nonetheless positing this because they're, uh, they're so uncomfortable with the concept of a designer. Right. There's a, um, a wonderful physicist in Cambridge named John Polkinghorne who was one of the pioneers in advancing this uh, fine-tuning design argument. Yeah. And in his wonderful British understated way, I got to interview him one time as you're doing with me. I wasn't nearly as funny, but uh, he, said, uh, he said, well, I, I don't say that the atheists are stupid. I just say that theism provides a more satisfying explanation. <laughs> and and there's, a, there's another reason for that and that's, that I explore in my book in, in some detail. Because I take this multiverse yeah. hypothesis, I take it very seriously, take it on as, a, as an alternative explanation. But it turns out that in order for you to have a plausible multiverse hypothesis, you have to have some mechanism for generating all the other universes. If these other universes were just out there and they had no connection to us at all, right. then they wouldn't affect the probabilities in our universe. In order to portray them as the outcome of a giant lottery, there must be some kind of common cause, some universe generating mechanism that's responsible for all the different universes, all the proliferation okay, of the now, same. Okay, now you're hurting my head, so you gotta stop. Okay. I'm right uh, to almost oh, to the payoff. Okay. All right. Okay. okay, and everyone will get this. Okay. Turns out that the, me the universe generating mechanisms yeah. themselves have to be finely tuned to produce new universes. Oh. 
that. So in order to explain the fine tuning, you have to invoke a mechanism that requires still prior fine tuning. That, that is hilarious. And that's why it is a not really great That is absolutely theory. hilarious. But I, I just find it funny because it gets to the bigger question, right? We live in a world where it is assumed that there's a problem between faith and science. Right. And there are many people who believe that uh, the problem with faith is that science disproves it or something. I mean, people believed that in the 18th century when they knew like nothing. No, it's, it's now the opposite. It, it's it's well, the, the committed scientific materialists or scientific atheists that are twisting themselves into pretzels right. to formulate these speculative cosmological theories to get around things like the fine-tuning or the evidence for a beginning that we've yeah. had since the 1920s and it, 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 with, the, with the Big Bang Theory. Well, th I, again, this is what I just find so funny because, uh, y you know, even I can see that it only becomes more difficult. Like something has happened, and who knew that this would happen, that science would inevitably point us more and more and more and more and more to the God hypothesis. You don't have to like it, you don't have to accept it, but you have to deal with it. Um, and that's basically what you're dealing with in this, in the new book, The right, Return of right, the God Hypothesis. Right, exactly. So, so what and else also, is in that book that we're not talking well, about? Well, the, 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 the two books I've done to this point are about the evidence for design at two key points in the history of life, the origin of the first life and then the origin of animal life. But in the, in the Cambrian, Cambrian explosion. explosion. Very good. Only about yeah. 550 yeah. million years ago. When I, when I was on a, a talk show with one of your colleagues, uh, Dennis Miller, he says, so Stevie, tell me about this Caribbean explosion thing, he says. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, He's like, no, that's a drink. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> But okay, so. anyway, what I'm doing in, in, the, in this book, I, I reprise those biological design arguments. But then, then I say, but let's look, what, do we, what else do we know that might help us identify the designer uh, to paint a profile of the, of, of the kind of intelligence that would be necessary to account for not just the evidence of design in biology, but the whole ensemble of evidence that we have about biological and cosmological origins. What could explain that fine tuning? If the multiverse just leads to a begging of the question and saying, well, you know, uh, pushing the, you know, the origin of that fine-tuning back one, one uh, degree of separation without answering it. What do we know? What, what kind of, then intelligent design really does look to be a better explanation, but now that intelligent design must have been present from the very beginning of the universe. It must have been capable of building that into the beginning of the universe, and that starts to look like an intelligence which transcends the universe itself. Okay, that's the key, right? right. You say not just at the beginning of the universe, but clearly at some point before the beginning of the universe. Exactly. And if you're talking about something before the beginning of the universe, you're talking about something before time. Well, and, and the developments in, in cosmology proper have reinforced that in a really powerful way. Um, I'll tell the story tomorrow in my talk in the morning about the discovery of the expanding universe and the, the, and the, the going in the other direction, the discovery that the universe had a beginning, now called the Big Bang Theory. Um, and it's an exciting story and lots of interesting twists and turns in it. But in 1968, after most of the observational evidence was now pointing to a beginning of the universe, right. Stephen Hawking, uh, working with the Oxford phys physicist Roger Penrose, proved something called the singularity theorem. We go back, we were talking about gravity a little bit ago. The new Einsteinian view of gravity is that if you have a massive body, it's curving the space around it. And Hawking was studying as a PhD student black holes, which are places where there's so much mass concentrated that it curves space so tightly that not even light can get out. And as he was working on, on that, he, be, he got to thinking about, well, what would happen? How does this apply to the whole cosmos? Because if the universe is expanding in the forward direction of time and matter is getting more and more dissipated, di dispersed, in the reverse direction of time, as you back extrapolate, you get to the point where matter would be getting more and more densely compacted, space would be getting more and more tightly curved, matter would be getting more and more densely compacted, and the math showed that at some point in the, in the finite past, there would be a point where the curvature of space would go to an infinite corresponding to zero spatial volume. And what I used to ask, like to ask my students is this, how much stuff can you put in no space? And common sense is no things go in no space. And so you, the new cosmology is moving in a 
decidedly anti-materialistic direction. Because if you want to explain the origin of the universe as a singularity in matter, space, time, and energy, you need a different kind of cause outside of matter, space, time, and energy. And uh, you know, many cosmologists and astronomers, Sandage being one, recognize that that had, frankly, theistic implications. That, look, that, that we were now painting a profile of the cause that really only God, in the way that Jews and Christians have portrayed him, uh, meets the, has the qualifications. And, wh and why do you say that? In other words, what if somebody says uh, there is some intelligence, but not a personal intelligence? Uh, is that possible? In other words, when you talk about where the scientific evidence is leading, number one, it leads us to the idea that there's a designer. But when you talk about the, the character of that designer or the, the, the identity of that designer, wh what is it exactly that's pointing uh, to that designer being the god of the Jewish uh, and Christian Bible. Well, by that, by, by that I mean a theistic creator who is transcendent and intelligent and active in the creation. So like not Zeus. Not, not, well, not Zeus, not right. a space alien, not a deistic creator. Deism wouldn't explain the bio evidence of biological design because a deistic creator only acts at the beginning. A theistic creator of the kind that is depicted in the Judeo-Christian scriptures acts at the beginning, but then is active in the creation after time equals zero as well. So what I do in the book is I look at the ensemble of evidence. From the Big Bang, you get transcendence. And you find this even in the materialistic theories, that they, they attempt to formulate some sort of other universes to account for what's going on in this one. That's a form of transcendence. Problem is they end up begging the question as to things like fine-tuning. Right. Um, so, but from the fine-tuning, the, the, the most natural thing to infer from that is a designing intelligence. But that designing intelligence must be operating from the beginning. And so when you conjoin the evidence from cosmology concerning the beginning of the universe right. with the evidence from physics concerning the fine-tuning of the universe, you get tr a transcendent intelligence as, uh, as the, the, the best explanation, what would be necessary to explain the effect. And then when you add the biological evidence okay, downstream... So that, that, okay, yeah. the biological evidence. So, so what you said is that uh, unless... If we're not talking about um, intelligent design, uh, before we get to this concept of intelligent design, we can talk about <clears throat> a God who is outside of time and space who created the universe. And what, then what, yeah. when we add intelligent design... You, in biology, then you can see that that wouldn't be a deistic creator because then... Okay, but a yeah. lot of people, including myself, are always unclear on deistic theistic. So what you mean is <laughs> that initially there's a God outside of time and space who creates the universe. But intelligent design says that science says that God is active after the creation of the universe. That's the, that's the evidence we have. That's the, the, the evidence These infusions currently. of information that are necessary to build new forms of life come well after the beginning. And so deism holds that God, there's a God, God created the universe in the beginning, but then has had a hands-off policy ever since. The watchmaker, clockmaker yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. The, okay. Yeah. And so what I do in the book is I, I, I examine all these, the, the, the scientific case for the beginning, the scientific case for the fine-tuning, and then the scientific case for the evidence of design and biology with the, the, these big infusions of information. And, the, and, then, and then, then I step back and I say, all right, now we, can have a, 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 we have a scientific hypothesis, the universe had a beginning. We have a scientific hypothesis or a philosophical hypothesis that there was design at the beginning. We compare that to the multiverse. And we, I argue there are reasons to prefer, prefer a theistic design hypothesis over the multiverse. But then I step back and I look at, well, what if we took the big worldview systems of thought, theism, deism, pantheism, the Eastern philosophical system, um, and, 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 uh, and materialism, and look at which, which and, and treat them as hypotheses. Call it a metaphysical hypothesis, a worldview hypothesis, scientific hypothesis, I don't care. We, we just want to know which one best explains this ensemble of evidence we have about biological and cosmological origins. Which one explains it best? Well, deism could explain the fine-tuning and the origin of the universe, right. the cosmology piece, but it doesn't do a good job of explaining the biology evidence. Right. The space alien hypothesis might, I'm, I'm really dubious on this, but might explain the biological design evidence, but it can't explain the cosmology of the physics. Because even an alien can't create the Big Bang. Can't, can't, because it operates, it's, it exists within the universe right. instead of expanding from that point forward. Right. 
And then if we look at pantheism, which, is, uh, which makes, God, it makes God and matter coextensive, it's the right. same thing. Right. So it has the same problem materialism it does. It has no transcendent entity to refer to, no, nothing beyond right. if the... God is inside time and space and the universe, uh, how did time and space and the universe get well, created in well the first said. place? Yeah, materialism can't explain any of these things because materialism, there's nothing beyond matter, space, time, and energy to do the causing, if you will, when you're talking about the origin of the universe or the origin of the fine tuning. And then when you get to the biological design case, that's a big argument I made in the books that we, we lack a materialistic explanation uh, for information. Okay, well, so I guess I have to, as you say all this, um, you know, you're saying that now uh, you have uh, put this together in such a way that if we had to guess based on the evidence, based on the scientific evidence, whether there's a God and whether that God is like the God of the Bible, we would at this point, because of the evidence, have to say yes. I would say we can infer a God with those attributes, transcendence, intelligence, great power, and and a God who is active in the creation on the basis of the evidence that we have in the natural world. We can move from that evidence to that hypothesis as a best explanation for the evidence itself. We don't, remember, we don't get proofs in science of the deductive form that you right. get in mathematics right. or of the ability, in the case of any historical science, we can't observationally verify that because all these things happened a long time ago. But Darwin couldn't either. Right. There's a different type of scientific reasoning we're using and it's sometimes called the, meth the method of multiple competing hypotheses or the method of inferring to the best explanation. It's the method that Darwin used, and it's the method that we use first to make the case for intelligent design, and the, and the, and the method that I use to argue that the best candidate for that designing intelligence is actually a, a God who has the attributes that Jews and Christians have long affirmed. I mean, but even taking it out of the realm of science, it's the method all of us use if, in we're, ordinary thinking, life. if we're thinking logically yeah, about right. is it this, 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 or this. In yeah. a murder mystery, this is what you're doing. This is what our brains do. Uh, and so, really, ultimately, Stephen, uh, what you're saying, therefore, strikes me as historic and extremely exciting. Do you have a sense of what you have? I'm tremendously excited about it. In part, it's so fun to do this interview here because the idea of this germinated for me on February 10th, 1985, listening to these amazing scientists. And I, I realized I want to be part of this. And I, I, I took, because of my relationship with Charles Thaxton, who mentored me, I took a deep dive on this origin of life question. And it yeah. took me till 2009 to get that book out. And I had a lot of people asking, are you ever going to write that book? Right. And, but I've now had the opportunity to come back to this and pull all these threads together. And it, it's a little sense, just personally, in my life, a sense that uh, my, my colleague Paul Nelson says, nothing goes to waste. And there's a sense that, yeah, all these side eddies, these great conversations I've had, uh, some of the tremendous the scientists I've met, the philosophers, the, the debates I've had with people on the other side of the, of the question, I know how they're thinking and I know what their objections are. And so in the book, I make the positive case and then I respond one by one to these, these objections. And I am excited. I, I do feel like the, the, we've landed the argument in the right place. We're not, I definitely don't want to overstate this. This isn't a proof. Um, I do want to overstate yeah, but But uh, I, I do think if you stand back and look at this, the universe had a beginning. The universe has been finely tuned since the beginning for life. And there have been big infusions of information into the cosmos, into the universe at periodic episodes after the beginning. When you add all that up, that looks like theism to me. Not like materialism, not like pantheism, not like deism, and certainly not like space alienism. And, w and when I add up what you just said... It sounds like the return of the God hypothesis is going to be a huge bestseller. That's my hypothesis. Um, my final question is, uh, Stephen Meyer, where can we get this lovely product? Well, right now it's available for pre-order on Amazon and a number of the other, uh, you know, online booksellers. So, I wanted to end yeah. with the tackiest possible question. <laughs> where can we get this fantastic product? Um, it is available for pre-order now. Yeah, right. Okay. 
And, and I know this since I'm an author sometimes. Uh, when you pre-order, they give you the best price between the day you order and the day it comes out. So if it like, and usually they drop the price, whatever. I didn't mean for this to be a commercial, but just so people understand, like they give you the best price for pre-ordering. Uh, Stephen, I am just like uh, flipped out, excited. I was already excited, but to hear you go through this, well, I just feel like we're living in a really exciting it's time. It's really exciting. There's an historian of science, um, Frederick Burnham, who says that the God hypothesis is a more a respectable hypothesis now than at any time in the last 100 years. And I'd go further than that and say that actually the God hypothesis provides the best explanation of this ensemble of evidence, but contrast that with the public perception of what science has to say about the credibility of belief in God that comes from so many popular authors, whether we're talking about Richard Dawkins or Bill Nye the Science Guy or Neil deGrasse Tyson or any of the popular new atheist uh, authors, we have exactly the opposite message being promulgated all throughout the right. culture, but they're talking about the science of the late 19th century, they're, and we've had a, a dramatic shift that they haven't kept up with. Well, that's right. Un unfortunately, we're out of time, but I guess... Uh, in closing, I want to say all those uh, uh, folks that you just mentioned, boy, they're in big trouble. Uh, your book is going to um, really ruffle some feathers, and uh, I, I, just, I just can't believe uh, that we've come to a point now uh, where we have this kind of evidence, and then we have you, who, it's my hypothesis, you were created by God, and that God created you to be able to put this stuff together so that the rest of us can understand that not only is there no problem between faith and science, but that science points to faith. That's crazy stuff. I'm very grateful for you, and we're grateful to all of you for coming. Stephen, thank you so much. God bless you.